delighted and really lucky to have Judy and Steve come and talk to us today. These are some of the most revered conference speakers out there. Um, authors, absolutely fabulous. I've used their work. Um, I, I've had the book for a number of years now. I'm a bit gutted because I, I met Judy again uh, just a few weeks ago and I didn't bring it to get it signed. I was a bit too shy to do that. Um, but there's some really, really useful stuff here and we're very, very lucky that Judy and Steve have given us their time to come and talk to us about about this. Barry has started the recording. Um, so if you're uh, if you're not kind of comfortable with that recording, we we do record that and we share that um, on, on the YouTube channel. And we're having a bit of trouble getting it up there at the minute, um, just with getting it out off the government estate. But um, that's the plan. Uh, so we have uh, we run monthly and if this is your first time, feel free to unmute and say hello in a minute. We just we usually do that to start off with. We've got an exciting bunch of talks planned for next year, starting off with um, equally as uh, as brilliant a chap called John Clapham. Um, and he's going to talk to us about some agile and some coaching things and the intersection between those things and, and, and getting stuff done. Now let's just maybe allow kind of a couple of minutes for anybody who maybe hasn't been before just to get themselves on camera and just say hello my name's Steve I, I work at DWP it's nice to be here if we just give people just a couple of minutes to do that that's, that's uh, our little ritual about starting has anybody has anybody um, not been before and wants to unmute say hello uh, I'll unmute and, and and say hello. Um, hi, my name is Nancy Cole. Um, I work in organisation development and design, working on culture. Um, and we're hopefully Judy and Steve are going to come and um, run something similar for our culture club community. And Steve, you really, I think it was you who contacted me, you really, really um, hooked me when you talked about the kind of things that this group speak about. So I'm really pleased to be here and I'm talking far too much, but also going to be supporting our digital people more. So um, yeah, looking forward to it all. Brilliant. Thanks, Nancy. Hi there, I'm Katie um, and I'm in the inclusion team at DWP. Um, yeah, so thank you. It's really nice to be here. Thanks. Welcome. Hi, my name's Joe Shaw. Hi, Barry. Wave, quick wave. I work in SMP, uh, Service Modernisation Programme, part of Change and Resilience, but I'm part of DWP, just so it doesn't matter what team I'm in, part of this yeah. great group of people. Nice to meet you all. Welcome, Jo. Hi, um, I'm Jo Blunt and I'm from the UK Hydrographic Office um, and I got the link through the Culture Club um, email that went out. So I thought I'd come along and see what it's all about. Brilliant. Welcome, Jo. Thank you. Trying up there. Judy, Steve, take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction, Steve. Um, so my name's Judy. That that's Steve McCann. And um concise conversations that count is the topic that we've said we'll talk about. Um you probably can't read these slides that are behind me, so I'm sharing a link to them in the chat. I hope you'll be able to see Google Slides. Um, fingers crossed, um, but they don't need to. They're just a visual aid. The, the um, information isn't on the slides, but it helps me to keep track and keep us on time and keep things rolling along. What I would love to know before we get into the detail is what you would like to have happen in this session. Please, would you write in the chat? What would you like to happen in this session? And while everybody's writing, one of the things I would love to have happen is that everybody has their cameras on so that I can see people's responses, which will help me to be less boring. It, the research also says that speakers are less boring if they can see their audiences. I'll share it afterwards or I'll, I'll share it as a PDF at some point. Um, what would you like to happen? How to start the conversation, Lucy? Excellent. Um, 
pick up some hints and tips. Be assertive without aggression. That could be really useful. Anything else that anyone would like to happen? But no cameras, bandwidth restrictions. Is there anything else that anyone would like to happen? Start the conversation. Encourage conciseness in others. Have difficult, concise conversation. Conversations to shape change. Ooh, interesting. I, I can I can hear a lot of pain behind to have to to inspire others to be more concise. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So we I can't guarantee that we'll be able to cover off all of those in less than an hour, but we will do our best to do something interesting, perhaps even exciting. And we'll aim to make this as interactive as we can. There will be a breakout rooms activity. Um, you'll get the most from this session if you do go into breakout rooms, though I appreciate not everybody can. So um, to dive in, as Steve has said, um, the stuff that underpins this talk, clean language, is something that I wrote a book about a long time ago. I've been working with it for more than 20 years. I find I'm really passionate about it. And what prompted this specific session and this specific title was a comment from a, pedi a pediatric consultant, Isham Abdullah. He's the head of quality improvement at Oxford University Hospitals, and he learned clean language from me about seven or eight years ago. And we met up with him again recently, and he was so enthusiastic about its impact on his practice. He said, when I use it, what matters to patients and what matters to me becomes very cr clear, crisp, concise, and it abbreviates a consultation. Like many doctors, he has seven minutes for a consultation often, and he really has to squeeze it in tightly. So using clean language, he found, had a really positive impact. And also somebody we taught more recently, Siobhan Aris, she works in palliative care. She's done all the communication courses. She was shocked by how much this challenged her practice. She was saying in a meeting yesterday, she is now a complete addict and uses it all the time. So there's a lot to, lot to play with there. And we, we were able to compare and contrast that. And I, I ask you to think about, gosh, it's, it's not have a go at GP's time. I've got a great GP up here in Yorkshire, but we, Judy went to see a specialist about a problem with her hip after falling off a bike. Oh, too much information, but there you go. Um, and the specialist she went to see it just seemed to be seven minutes of that particular person demonstrating knowledge and superiority and saying what was going to happen without really ever discovering what the patient wanted or thought or concluded. Um, and it turns out we're not the only ones to have had that experience. So, you know, working within the health service. So that was quite interesting. So you can compare and contrast any experiences you've had and you will have had all sorts good bad in different experiences of, of, of someone trying to get stuff quickly. And then just think about what Hisham said. He gets it quicker, right first time with engaged people. And I thought, oh, we're onto something here. Absolutely. So I, th I think probably the best way to explain what clean language is, apart from just saying clean language is not about not swearing, and it's only peripherally about being clear with what you say, the best way to really help you to understand it is to give you an experience. So in order to get that teed up, get it set up, what I'd like you to do is for about a minute in the privacy of your own mind and make a note of your answer. What are some of the things that stop you from understanding people at work? What are some of the things that stop you understanding people at work? Make a note of one, two, three, four things that stop you from understanding people at work. I'm guessing that everybody does have the experience of uh, things stopping them from understanding people. You're, you're muted, Steve. I don't know why. 
good old Microsoft Teams. Um, yeah, we, we're sticking to the work focus for the time being, but you know anything we do here actually can transfer into non-work context as well if you choose it to. But we're not going to do that today. Has everybody got one or two things that stop them from understanding people? Is anyone willing to just uh, quickly sing out an example so that in anyone who needs some inspiration can can draw on that? Joe. Um, I've put here, sometimes I'm not clear why the conversation is happening in the first place. So you're second guessing. Fantastic. Thank you. And Michelle's put in the chat, she's put abbreviations. Yes, that oh, I, abbreviations of everything, aren't they confusing? Um, Jennifer said, assume knowledge, technical language. These are all great examples. So if, if you if you don't ex don't have any of your own problems, borrow one of these. You'll need a couple of examples for the activity we'll be doing in a moment. Before we go to the activity, though, let me just show you what we're going to be up to. I want you to compare two questions. The first question. How can I help? And the second question. Um, and when problem or obstacle? What would you like to happen? Do you notice this different between those two questions? Mute and shout, don't don't be writing in the chat now. Somebody must notice the difference between the two questions. For me, the difference. So, oh, somebody's put their hand up. Go on, Katie. Yeah, the ones about passing that off on to someone else. Even if you, even the other Does that make sense? You, you, you were a bit. Can't hear me there. Sorry, you were a bit distorted, Katie, initially. Um, <laughs> no, let me just repeat myself. Please. Of course, yeah. I was just saying, um, one kind of takes individual yeah, responsibility yeah. for what happens, whereas one kind of makes it um about what you want the outcome to be, rather than how you can be part of the solution. Thank you. Which is what for me. Which is which? Well, breaks it down. What you're capturing there. Not much else. The bottom one is one that yeah, kind of focuses on what the end point is rather than how you're involved in it. Yeah. Thank you. The difference. Thanks. Mohammed, you were saying. I, I was going to say. The obvious one for me is one is about I and one is about you. Mm, one is about I, one is about you. And what difference does that make? Mohammed. So it's about, you know, offering something to somebody. So when can I help or how can I help? So there's an offer for you there. So you've got your time to think and reflect of what help you want, when you want it, how you want it, et cetera. And the other one is actually, you know, go away and have a think about whatever it is that you're doing. And when you've got a problem, when you have a problem, an obstacle, what would you like to do? Therefore, it's something that person can reflect on and then come back and have a look and say, this is what I would like. It's almost the the second question then comes into play. It's like, OK, mm. how can I help? So it really is that that piece about giving the person time and opportunity to think about when they want the intervention. Mm. Thank you. This comparing these two questions, this is the biggest win that he sham got from learning clean language, he said. He used to always begin his consultations with how can I help? Now he begins with and when. What would you like to happen? And it's hard to argue with how can I help on the face of it, isn't it? But but we're 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 saying, hmm, maybe not, because there's a number of things implicit within that. The hierarchy. There's power, knowledge, there's rescue um, that sit subliminally, implicitly within the how how can I help? But it but it is actually, Hisham was telling us, is actually what he was taught to say as as a as a younger doctor, because it, it, it seems to make sense. It's friendly, it's inviting, it's part of the psyche of, you know, he, he's in that profession because he wants to help people. 
So it's it's kind of feels a bit awkward saying, well, maybe it's not great, but but it takes you on a trajectory that I think if we stand back and rather critically look at how things are, one of non-agency, one of knowledge supremacy. And it actually wastes a lot of time and people come away not feeling understood, listened to or heard because they don't actually necessarily know the answer to that question. That's where the inequality of knowledge comes in. But they do know what they want to have happen. I think there's, uh, there's an important piece to this. In order to start the conversation, you have to say, how can I help? Because people are then going to tell you what, what they're experiencing, what they, they're suffering with, whatever. But then it's like, we then have to turn that round on its head. So you've explained the situation, uh, what would you like to happen? And that is, that is a far more powerful piece then, because you've managed to get out of them what they, they, they're seeing as, as their perspective, what they think you can do to help them. And then you've taken that on board and you've gone, OK, I can see where you're coming from. What is it you want to happen then? Mm -hmm. And then you, and yes. you, you've, taken the, you've taken it then, you've put it back on to them, because they're then expressing ex exactly what it is they want. It, it's arguable. Uh, is that Thomas? It's Chris. Chris. Oh, I, don't, I haven't got the hang of uh, names of the way around yet, have I? Are, Sorry, Chris. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm kind of like, yeah, that's arguable. That's arguable. But this is about concise conversations. And how can I help is starting a trajectory that I'm going to argue isn't really the one you want. You can do other framing contextual things to make people feel relaxed, welcome, appreciated, understood. And I'm going to say, actually, is, is that just you've got seven minutes? And we're looking at the GP context here. You've got seven minutes. That will take you down a path that is has been trodden for a lot of decades. And nobody's saying it's terrible. Well, actually, I'm kind of saying it's not right. You don't have to do that and then say, and what would you like to have happen? You can, but this is about concise conversations. The argument here is going to be start there. OK, no, I, I can see where you're going with it. Mm. I think I'd like to be a fly on the uh, on the surgery wall when you go in. <laughs> oh, that's not, that's not ethical. But, but Hisham can talk to you about it. <laughs> let's give you an opportunity to be a fly on a virtual wall now in a little activity. So you have an opportunity to test out that second question. In a moment, um, Barry's going to break the group into groups of about four. And this is what you're going to do in the breakout. So I've just added it to the chat. What you're going to do is somebody's going to take their turn to read out one of their problem, one of their obstacles that they wrote down a moment ago. So, for example, um, people keep using abbreviations. And one of the other people in the group is going to ask the question. And when people keep using abbreviations, what would you like to happen? And you listen to the answer. And then you swap around and somebody else takes a turn at stating the, the problem and somebody else takes a turn at asking the question. The groups of four, you'll probably only have time to do it one question each. If you find yourself in a group of two, you might have a chance to do two questions each. Don't get into a big discussion about the problem. Just go statement of problem, ask a question, answer the question and move on. Structural note, we picked four because we don't have 100% confidence that every breakout room is going to be accepted by every invitee. So we want at least two per breakout room. That's just what's going on there as a structural thing. Could you do one more thing for us? Try and use their exact words, not your version of their words. See how that goes. And the other people in the breakout, assuming this group of four, the others notice what happens. Is there a pattern about what happens when people are asked this question? Does that make sense to everybody? Instructions clear? Barry, take it away. We'll give them about 
eight minutes in these groups. Right. Longer than you think, but give it a go. It'll pass quickly. I'm opening the rooms. It should it takes a 30 second, 20 seconds or something. Joe Shaw, big thank you. Your your facial responses to what we're saying is making it so much easier from this end. Oh, thank you. Uh, but I'm rubbish at cards, just to be warned. <laughs> <laughs> I think you and I have a poker game waiting for us somewhere. <laughs> Hello. Hello. There you are. Just last couple of people disappearing. I've known that I've missed the call. Oh, I think you're you're being I think you're being assigned, Michael. OK, you might disappear in a moment. Or you might not. <laughs> <laughs> he says I'm you are assigned to, to a room. I must be. I've only just joined. Ah, uh, oh, there he's gone. Oh, there he's gone. It can be. It's a little bit difficult to control when you auto, when you have large numbers of people. And we had, I think, it's seventy-eight. Yeah. It's a bit. It's a bit tricky to assign them to rooms. You have to automatically assign them. So unfortunately, mm -hmm. you you got assigned, Judy, and and then anyone who like pops in, it can be. Yeah, take a little while to process them. There we go. You're on mute. Yeah. It's one of the downsides of teams, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. I want. Oh, sorry. Go on. No, I think it's just you speaking, Steve. No, it's just me. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about the slides in the top corner and stuff and uh, and why you do that. I think I mean, I, th I think I've got some ideas, but I just wanted to ask you about that. Well, I I like there to be um, a visual aid to, to say she's got a plan. She knows what she's talking about <laughs> um, yeah. and all of that. So I, I just like to do that. I don't I really hate share screen because yeah. it. Um, it just completely dominates everything. You can't see the group anymore. Yeah. Um, I'm quite persuaded that what Barry's doing with his uh, flip chart is also very, very effective. Yep. Yep. It's oh, gorgeous. people, people love the flip chart. It's it's huge. I use I use this all the time with, you know, for presentations and stuff. I try not to do slides anymore. But it's great when I'm at home, when I'm in the office. It's not yeah. quite so easy. Mm. Um, and what I've done the last couple of sessions I've done where I've had to do something in the office is I've photographed my flip charts, put them into a PowerPoint, and then kind of like you've gone into presenter mode um, so that there's me quite large, but also the flip chart. But you, I mean, without three screens, you can't really see what's going on. <laughs> No. Thing. Mm -hmm. Can people easily read your flip chart? I mean, we can read that pre-prepared manual for me, but when you're just writing on a flip chart, do you find people can read it? Um, yeah, I mean, norm normally, I if I'm doing something, I I will move it closer. Mm. Um, but yeah, this is. Yeah, let's, 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 let's something else on the chart. I'm not actually. Yeah. Anything? Yeah, I mean this is it's like Barry. That's that's probably a bit small, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah, I mean that is that is quite detailed. Um, anyway, but normally I would. Yeah, if I was presenting. Yeah. Yeah, bring it up I'm, close. I'm like this. <laughs> I 
<laughs> yeah, I've seen that face on LinkedIn before yeah. that. Yeah. And then, yeah, I always screenshot myself for LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah, Jenny, Jenny's up, saying in the chat that she was not, a, she was on her own in her breakout room, so she's come oh. back. Um, oh dear. So while you're here, Jenny, can I can I ask you the question? Yeah, sure. Have, have you got have you got a, an obstacle? Oh, I never mean mine's gone blank. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, communicating across a very large organisation. And when communicating across a very large organisation, what would you like to happen? I don't want to clutter. There's lots of information that they all get. So I would like to cut through all that clutter so that they hear the message that I'm trying to get across. Mm -hmm. Cut through all the clutter so they hear the message. Thank you. That's a good example. Would you like to ask, would you like to ask one of the others? Has anybody else got any issues? <laughs> <laughs> Barry, Steve, have you got an obstacle that you could use as an example? Go on, Stephen. What's yours? Yeah, um, the desire to get stuff done, like it's an obstacle to good communication, to just get it done, sort it out, bit of time. OK, so in your desire to get stuff done and the fact that it's an obstacle and that you need to get it done, cut, get on time, what is it that you would like to happen? Less stuff, less things to focus on, um, more priorities and more uh, focus. Da -da. See, problem Thank solved. You. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jennifer. Um, no, where do right. I send my coaching fee to? Yeah, please do. <laughs> the Ministry of Defence. <laughs> Steve, have, have a go on Barry's problem. Barry, go for it. What's your oh, the, the one that I posted, you mean? Um, oh, or any problem, like any any problem. You can choose anyone. Yeah, I think I have a lot of problems when some people are dominating the conversation and other people who have things to say don't get time to explain their important point. And when people are dominating the conversation, what would you like to have happen? I'd like them to self-restrain and self-control and respect others more. Yeah, I'd like to have people bring about people want to be in that position. And Barry, you can ask me if you like. I've got to come up with an answer though. Yeah, so what's your what's your what's your problem, Judy? Um, Your obstacle. Uh, my headset keeps going on the blink. Oh, that's very clear. So when your headset goes on the blink, what would you like to happen? I'd like it to um, sort itself out and work consistently. And if if it stops working, I'd like to at least know that it's not working. Fabulous. Mm -hmm. Right, our eight minutes are up. Shall Excellent. I close the rooms? Yes, please. Bring everyone back. When we when we do the video, we'll 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 edit out this section because it's never terribly interesting. Well, my my, brought, my, while... my idea oh. in getting everybody here to do it was so that there would be something on the tape. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, in terms of clear. Then we won't. Oh. Oh. Everybody's coming back. Um, like magic. If you're just back in the room, especially if you've got background noise where you are, please mute yourself. Excellent. Thank you. Have we got everybody? I think so. So what I'm curious about is what was the pattern? What happened when you or when people were asked this question. I don't mind going, Judy. Go ahead, Joe. I was saying it opened up a rich conversation, to be honest, because we were a bit, I guess both Cameron and I were a little bit dubious how it would go. 
and actually by putting the agency back on the person opened up a broader conversation um, than probably would have been had if we'd just gone straight to how can I help just seems as a fix and a solution so it actually opened up a broader conversation and kept the agency with the individual so yeah. it sort of worked mm. kept did, the sorry, agency Jill. with the individual yeah and opened up a broader conversation yes and somebody else was speaking then sorry it was a camera and I was in with Joe on that mm -hmm. session um but I was just called away for another conversation that was going on here. Somebody needed some advice. Um, yeah, I it, it was it was a broader conversation, but it was still a more focused conversation with the onus on the individual who was having the issue rather than. I don't know, an, an expectation of tell me what I can do. It, it, it did put that focus and keep it there. Mm, thank you. I think I think just to add as well, it encouraged framing it in a way that allowed for a bit more active listening so rather than trying to solve a problem you were, you were listening or trying to put solutions out there you were listening to the problem and actively hearing what that person was saying mm. you're actively hearing actively listening rather than just trying to fix the problem michael wright you were nodding there anything to add i, I was in the same group as, uh -huh. as thomas so yeah um it, it's exactly how it worked out for us it was Trying to understand the problem so you could make sure you phrased the question correctly, and then it just became a very um, kind of rich interactive conversation. So. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Anyone have a similar or a different experience in their group? Um, I'll go if you like. Um, so um, I found that it you had to think around the answer a little bit more so you, it was really easy so the one that um natalie had was um people not having a point um so when you ask the question and when people are not having a point what would you like to happen the obvious answer is for them to have a point <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yes yes um so then then that opened into you know so so is there more to that you know is there an action that has to happen um for 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 that person to realize that maybe people are thinking that they don't have a point so you know it closed it down but then you had to open it up again as well um mm, interesting so it closed it down and you had to open it up again yeah to make it meaning to make the conversation carry yeah. on because they need to have a point just kind of shuts it doesn't it yeah, so, but yeah, yeah. if you just keep quiet and make them keep talking, <laughs> <laughs> off we go. Thank you. Anyone else have a something similar or different to share? Uh, at, hi, it's uh, Ali here. Um, at my group was talking about like the different comms channels and how that can affect uh, the understanding. Um, you know, so if you if you if for example if it is a bit about abbreviations how a small team or a larger team can sort of cope with that. Do they change the verbal language? Do they share a written document, you know, to, uh, and get more feedback from the team? So that was quite interesting and it overcrossed the other conversations in the same mm -hmm. way. Yeah, thank you. Oh, and Dana has her hand up, Junior. Dana. Hi everyone, I'm Dina. Um, Dina. So very similar experiences to some of the colleagues here. It definitely opened up a conversation. Um, so our point was around jargon and assumed knowledge. And some of the top uh, some points that came up were around safety, psychological safety to be able to express, you know, you know, asking someone to clarify what something means. And then sometimes if you're in an environment where you don't feel able to speak and ask those questions, for example, maybe in an SLT meeting, you don't want to be perceived as not understanding something where there might be an assumption that you should know. Mm. Uh, we spoke about that having kind of the confidence to be able to ask um, in those environments. And um, I think I had Joe and Satya uh, in our group and we touched a point uh, around uh, communication and in certain certain um, communities, it, if it's jargon, it might be IT related and it might be OK for those particular audiences. But it's understanding the audience around you as well to be able to um, 
uh, adapt your communication <laughs> to the right audience. Thank you. So interesting. So everybody managed to do a bit of these question asking and question answering, but we're also discovering themes in the kinds of challenges that people were talking about and learning more from each other by asking these questions. The single biggest pattern that people find with this question is that it tends to switch the person's attention away from what they don't want and towards what they do want. Did anyone notice that happen? Even if what they want is the absence of something, which is again, you can turn that around once you get the conversation going. And there's a, there's a, there's a value in that when there is um, a switch of attention from what you don't want towards what you do want. The easiest way of describing that value is you never go to the supermarket with a list of all the things you don't want. Do you know, one day somebody's going to say, I do, but it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> it's much easier to get the groceries done if you have a list of what you actually want, that you can go straight there. But most people spend most of their time paying attention to what they don't want. It's a natural evolutionary tendency. Human beings have evolved to notice dangers and problems and pay attention to those. But when we pay attention to what we want, we find it much easier to get it. So that's one way that this question can be useful. It's certainly one way that Hisham found it was useful. The others, We've touched on them. Various people have mentioned the fact that the second question, the what would you like to happen, gives much more agency to the person being asked. When you offer, how can I help you? It puts a hierarchy in place. It implies that I, the helper, have something that you want or need. That's an inference of that question. And it, of course it might be true. But equally. The person being offered the help, how, how can how can they possibly know how you can help them? Oh, they might, but they, they might, they, but they, they might not. And it's, it's perhaps not the right question, is it? And, and I think Dina spoke about psychological safety. That's actually quite implicit and important within this. You don't have, I mean, <laughs> who's been in a meeting and said, we're psychologically safe here? It's like, no, mate, just saying it doesn't make it so. There's an awful lot that goes around that in terms of the tone, the power language that we're not talking about here, that I believe you you have awareness and skills in, in, in yourselves that's hugely important in this, the tone, the metaphor, the space that you have with you and the other person that we can't really replicate here. But I, I would argue that what would you like to have happen or have or happen is inherently a, a potentially more psychologically safe question than, than other ones because you, you're not saying what are you going to owe me for by the time you leave this room although that's not what you're really saying and how can i help you but it could be read that way um so it just starts from just about the right place you see in terms of trajectory starting from this place and um and chris is what i was saying at the beginning starting from this place as opposed to getting to this place, just points you in a certain direction. And I think it's going to be faster, more concise and more outcome orientated. And when you really know, and if you if we ask you that question, what would you what you'd like to have happen or happen instead or, you know. Sometimes people won't quite know yet. And that's actually an interesting place to start from as well. If they don't quite know yet, Perhaps they're not ready to come and, and you know, otherwise, well, for, for concise and productive conversations, it would be better if they did. And perhaps you could help them to, to frame and get to that point. And then it becomes much more actionable and, and work orientated for both of you. And having had this experience of one clean language question, let me just say a little bit larger, um, larger frame around clean language. So um, there are a bunch of these questions in the clean language question set. 
about 12, it depends how you count them because a couple of them are very similar to each other, but about 12 <coughs> questions all have this um, feature of having a space in the question. We usually represent it with an X for the other person's words. So in this example, we, um, sorry, the bells and buzzers going off all over my screen, um, <laughs> which is something to do with teams. Um, yes, yeah, so the, uh, sorry, I'm completely thrown by this at the moment. Don't look at the chat, it'll put you off. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so there are a bunch of these clean language questions. All of them have spaces for the other person's words, just as we use the other person's words when describing the problem. And all of them have this feature of shifting the energy, the, the, the locus of control onto the person being asked the questions. They can be used for a whole bunch of different things and have a whole bunch of different benefits. Um, fundamentally, they help people to understand themselves and understand each other better. So what do you mean by what you say? What do you really mean by what you say? And as a result of that better shared understanding, um, you build greater trust between you and you can work better together. Um, clean language was originally devised by a guy called the David Grove. He died um, about 15 years ago, so he's, uh, his work lives on for quite a long time after him. Clean language is increasingly being used in work contexts of various kinds. You might, in your um, agile journeys, have come across a guy called uh, Mike Burroughs, who wrote a book called A Gender Shift. He uses clean language very um, uh, frequently in a lot of his different activities. Um, and um, I know that clean language is used in various coaching practices in the civil service. Um, one of my colleagues, Lynn Cooper and Mariette Castellino, they wrote a book called The Five Minute Coach. And you might want to look up the five minute coach model if you've uh, got an interest in, in coaching. Um, that's another clean language based approach. Pauses for breath and also to say it's quarter to the hour. We have about 15 minutes left. Given that, what would you like to happen now? Please write in the chat. What would you like to happen next now? George has put something in the chat to go through the, tel the 12 questions. That's got 10 thumbs up on it. And then, <laughs> so there's a slight steer there from the group. OK, so I, I've shared a link in the chat which gives you a list of the questions. I think me reading them out off a slide is not a good use of the group's time, but I think it's reasonable. Um, for you to have a look at those questions. And if you'd like to hit me with questions about those questions. Um, Nancy's saying ideas how we could give this a try this week. What opportunities we might have? I think that's a very interesting question. Um, but George, it, given that um, I've shared a link to the 12 questions, does that answer what you're asking for? Or would you like something different? Uh, I think I'm getting it. So the development questions, the one you'd ask first, and then you've got the sequence and source questions to follow and intention questions to close to an action. If, if you follow it, a, a caution Thank you. path. That, that's not really the, stru the structure of a clean, la clean language based coaching model, um, yeah. but you can categorise them like that if that's useful to you. Um, 
typically uh, so the intention question that we've been talking about what would what would you like to happen or what would you like to have happen is usually the first question to be asked in this list on this page it happens to be the third from the end because of the way mm -hmm. they're categorized um, so you'd usually say what would you like to happen get an answer and then ask some of those developing questions about that answer and then um, perhaps explore sequence and source questions before moving on to what needs to happen for that to happen. So that that's the lightning quick summary of how, which order you'd use them in. There, there's an art and a science to using these questions in a coaching context. So I would encourage you at the very least to look online for the summary of the book, The Five Minute Coach, which talks about the structure of, of a coaching session using these questions. You can also, if you'd like to, uh, if you like to watch videos of this kind of thing, you can find a bunch of videos about the various questions on my YouTube channel, which is YouTube X-Ray Listening. Um, and that will exp give some explanations of the five minute coach model and a bunch of other things. It, it, it can, clean language, George, if you could use it in coaching, be, be thoughtful and careful to start with. Uh, it can go to the heart of things exceptionally quickly. And I feel the need to just talk about guardrails and guide rails, go for the good stuff. Questions like what kind of and anything else about, they're the two most common, what kind of resource would you like to have? Is there anything else about that resource? Those two are called the lazy Jedi questions because they're the most common. They're very, just having those in your back pocket minimizes the digital load of, oh, how, what's the question? How do I, oh, how, if you've just got those two and they're, they're quite straightforward to get the hang of what kind of anything else about, that'll take you a long way. And I would absolutely stick to the good stuff because if you get into people's metaphorical landscape and start asking those questions about bad stuff, you go down a very, very, very steep dark hole very quickly. And please don't just don't <laughs> just that 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 guardrail in there. There is a therapeutic branch to clean language that we 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 don't practice. Mm. So Steve 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 Mouncy, can I just ask you about what you've just posted in the chat because it it's a really lovely example of what Steve was just Steve McCann was just saying. Um, so when your kids tell you they're ill, you often ask what kind of ill. That's a really important mm. question, isn't it? We we need to know what's what's wrong but yeah. this question that we just talked about and when i've got a headache what would you like to happen will tend to direct their attention to something that they would like to have even though they are ill the thing is energy goes energy flows where attention goes that if you put people's attention on what they don't want and on uncomfortable things like being ill they will feel worse if you put their attention on nice things like i'd like an ice cream they'll feel better so it's well worth having this this question and when obstacle what would you like to happen in your pocket for any situation where somebody is talking about things they don't want? It, it, it was christened the switcher, the switcheroo, which I quite like. We were working with in Edinburgh uh, with, a, with an institution and one of the um, participants said, oh, it's a switcheroo. And the name kind of stuck for a while. We, we've let it go now, but it, it says it quite well. It, it's a tremendous way of acknowledging the not want and turn the energy around with a sense of agency aligned into it as well. And th there's a philosophical thing with clean language. I was talking about it with the group I was in that's quite important. It is about encouraging you to understand others and for others to understand themselves and what they mean. And when you pay that quality of attention and use their words, and I asked you to use their words because it's significantly different, a parrot phrase will... Um, make people feel as though you have understood them and hopefully you have but it will give them confidence that you heard what they said when you paraphrase we naturally calibrate what comes back to work out if it's what we said in the first place and that signal interference can get in the way now paraphrasing can be very useful there's a time and place for it absolutely but if it's about rapport developing understanding getting to the point 
then actually using their words is a useful thing to be able to do. Now, here's the thing. It's not super easy to use their words unless you've been really listening. So there's a little pattern going on within the process that encourages and requires an acute ear and a desire to listen. And that's kind of where it comes from as well, if that's a useful thing to add and say. Yeah, I want to share an example of where uh, a civil servant, actually someone in the National Audit Office, used this question in, um, she, she'd had the role of the performance coaching one of her colleagues. And she was talking to me about it and asking for my advice. And she was saying, and I, I asked her, how much coaching training have you had to do this performance coaching job? She said, none. OK, I said, let me give you the 20 minute uh, coach training. And I taught her this question. The person that she was coaching, would, her experience had been that the person would come along with a long list of all the things that were wrong in her life and basically offload them on, on this lady. And um, it was just miserable. It was making both of them miserable. So I said, right, this question. And when problem, what would you like to happen? And I also shared with her the idea of putting all the problems one at a time on sticky notes on a table because they were going to meet in person, all on sticky notes in a table. And then they would go, and when that one, what would you like to happen? And when that one, what would you like to happen? And then that one, what would you like to happen? And so th they went away and uh, I got an email back. I haven't yet spoken to this lady since the session, but I have had an email back from her saying, wow, that was amazing. I had the most fantastic conversation with my coachee. And she now has stuff that she can get on with and do. And that that's the kind of thing that can happen when you put people's attention on what they want and not what they don't want. So the, the, the very simple, what can you do? You've asked a very excellent question. All right, this week, what can I, what's one thing, what can I do? Think about a time and place where you can try this question with superiors, with peers, with subordinates. I don't know how hierarchical or structural the, the world in the civil service is at the moment. I, I've got, I don't have the experience, but in any context you feel that, that's, that's comfortable and, and good for you, Move away from how can I help you or whatever into what would you like to happen questions and support it with the power language, the psychological safety that Dina mentioned um, and the invitation to talk. Because, of course, there are different ways of saying what would you like to happen, <laughs> some of which are more inviting and agency sharing than others. And just notice what happens. There's a bunch of other stuff that goes with this clean language and Judy's put in the chat, if you want to, we are able at the moment to give um, a limited number of free places on um, a clean language course, quite a conversational introductory clean language course that we're involved with Better Conversations Foundation with, um, five by one hour. If we have tickled your attention, get in touch with us afterwards because they uh, there are some slots available next year to, to, to do that. That might be interesting to some people. If you are interested in that, do email me. I'm afraid I can't uh, send a general link to everybody and everybody on the mailing <laughs> list. Um, but so drop me an email at judy at judyreese.co.uk and uh, we'll see if we can squeeze you in. Well, we can some. And so how are you going to use it? What we've already seen in the chat from an unknown unknown, unknown user that someone's off to um, experiment. Um, how else might you use it? Joe TT, how will you use it? Literally just about to message that I'll hop off to prep for a two o'clock meeting. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I've got might, two o'clock as well. I might I might well use it there. I'm running a retro with a group that I'm not that ah. familiar with at two o'clock. And I think it's probably it's great that that's so fresh in my mind because it's something to try and open a conversation up and cry, try and create some some sense of sort of trust with a group that I'm not familiar with. Um, so I'll keep you posted how it goes. Lovely. So you in a retro, you could use it at the very beginning of the retro. What would you like to happen in this retro? You can also gather up all the things that have gone wrong and say, when all of this has gone wrong, what would you like to happen? 
Yeah, or like the same question to multiple people. If there's like a theme, if there's like three or four yeah. people all giving the same piece of feedback, they might have a different different sense of what they'd like to happen next. Oh, almost certainly, Joe. That's a really good point. And one of the great things about working with clean language, it's a brilliant way of encouraging equity, diversity. You just, oh, so I haven't got long enough to talk about it. Uh, getting the quieter voices in the room heard. It's very, very good for that. But that's perhaps another conversation. If what they want to have happen isn't within your gift, it's a really good place to be to know that there and then. So you might get something that you can't do, but you're much better off knowing that and saying it than somebody leaving the room thinking, well, I said what I wanted and they didn't do it, which is a bit of a nightmare for both of you. So that clarity is very actionable and that's a good hygiene point. Steve. I, I just wanted to come in and um, wrap it up and draw everybody to a close. And initially, let's have a massive round of applause for. So, if everybody could unmute, um, <laughs> just a massive round of applause. Thanks again, Judy and Steve. It's it's really really useful for us uh, as a group. So, thanks for giving us your for giving us your time. Uh, in January, we have John Clapham. That'll be on Monday, the 29th of Jan. Or, or sometime that week. Um, Agile leadership with a dollop of flow coming up. And John is another, he's a keynote speaker, just, just as uh, Studio and Steve are. So really, really high quality um, speakers. So get yourselves along to that one too. It's been an absolute pleasure. Hopefully everybody's got Judy's contact details and uh, feel free to reach out. Thanks very much, Steve. I'll ask. I'll send you the PDF of the slides. If you could share it with everybody, that would be brilliant. And perhaps yes. a link into some more resource. Yeah, there'll be there'll be a, there'll be an additional slide within the slides with a whole bunch of resources. For those of you with two o'clock, go in peace. I've got one too. <laughs> we, Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Thank bye. Right. Thanks, Steve. We uh, oh, we're done, aren't we?